Today we have wonderful disciples of Srila Prabhupada. Chandramali Swami Maharaj. Bhakti Vigyan Goswami Maharaj. Bhavananda Prabhu. I could speak for many hours about each of them, but better that we hear from them. Let us very enthusiastically and sincerely welcome them to Shivada Gopal. <laughs> We also have two of my dear God sisters coming from the United States of America, very faithful disciples of Srila Prabhupada, Rasalila Devi Mataji and Sukhavaha Devi Mataji. Please welcome them to Sri Radha Gopinath. <laughs> Nama Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale, Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine. Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Prajarine, Nirvasesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya Devi Satarine. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nithananda, Sri Advaita Gadadara, Sivasari Gaura Bhakti Vinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Ram, 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 Hare Hare. So would like to thank His Holiness Radhanath Maharaj and all the wonderful devotees here. Just to echo a little bit of what Bhavananda Prabhu mentioned at the beginning of his talk, how wonderful, enlivening, inspiring, and I guess the thing that hit, hits me the most about Chaupati is everyone is so serious. <coughs> I don't find that in a lot of places. How everyone is so dedicated and serious about Krishna consciousness. And Bhavananda Prabhu made a nice analogy in that point how he mentioned that when I asked for volunteers, it wasn't difficult to find 500 people to come forward and, and offer some service, not only just to do it as a service, but enthusiastically. Um, so when I come here each year, actually I feel it's necessary for me to come here each year in order for me to continue in my devotional service throughout the year. It's an opportunity for me to become re-inspired and rejuvenated. Again, feel the strength of, we say, in a place where there is so much purity, surrender, and intelligence, determination, creativity, and most important, loving devotion. And so when I come here each year, I, I leave here and I, can, I look forward to actually going out and trying to do my service and I feel more inspired. So I thank you all for being who you are and especially, as Bhavananda Prabhu mentioned, it's the purity of Radhanath Maharaj's surrender and what we say, desire to please Srila Prabhupada by spreading his mission in a very powerful way. And it's glorious. Because you say even if one soul becomes a pure devotee, it's, it's a great achievement. But how many wonderful devotees have been made by this, simply by this project headed by Radhanath Maharaj? And now so many other persons are taking up the same enthusiasm that he has in order to spread Krishna consciousness. So this is really not only wonderful, it's rare. <laughs> it's rare. It's very rare. And it's very inspiring.
I asked Babananda Prabhu to speak first because one of the reasons I asked him is because I didn't know what I was going to say. And then he asked me after he finished his talk, Okay, now you're ready, and I still realize I don't still don't know what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> but I was thinking, we talk a lot about surrender and the importance of surrender. And Srila Rupa Goswami mentions in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu that there are six, we say, principles or points that make up surrender to the Lord. And I'll just list them. One is to accept things that are favorable for one's devotional service. Those things that are recommended in the scriptures and given by the spiritual master as principles that we should adopt and apply in our spiritual life. And those things that are against those principles and that are unfavorable for our devotional service that make us forget Krishna or take us away from the principles of devotional service. Those things we should be very careful to know and at the same time reject. To accept things favorable and to reject things unfavorable. Now to have that discrimination takes some experience, some intelligence, but most of all it takes association and, by, and hearing from those persons regularly who have that understanding. Because Maya is very strong and Maya is very subtle. And in her subtleties, especially the subtleties of as we make advancement in devotional service, we start to think in terms of I did it. And Babananda Maharaj, Babananda, I can't even call him Maharaj because he speaks like a Maharaj. He, he speaks with what we say clarity, purity, and what we say assurity. And that was what, that's what really inspired me about Prabhupada. Prabhupada always spoke with surety. It wasn't maybe, perhaps, it's like this. It's not a question of any other consideration. It's like this. Prabhupada was clear. And it was, he wasn't trying to somehow or other present it in a way that would you know, convince people. He was convinced. And because he was convinced, we also became convinced. So in our progress in devotional service, we always have to be very careful to follow these two principles, to accept things that are favorable and reject things that are unfavorable. Things that are favorable are things that help us remember Krishna conscious, or Krishna, and things that, are, that are, are necessary for our engagement in devotional service. Things that are unfavorable, those things like such as criticism, fault finding, Laziness, wasting time, just, I think one of the greatest, and I speak from experience, from a negative aspect, the greatest, let me say, detriment in Krishna consciousness is laziness, or lethargy or taking it easy, the attitude of somehow or thinking every... Because, you know, sometimes when you come to a very pure place, you know, you just ride the waves of the energy that's here. And so many devotees are enthusiastic. And, and, but we also have to fly our own plane. We also have to also work hard and keep our determination and Krishna consciousness strong. So sometimes we can become a little lazy, a little complacent, because so many wonderful things are happening around us. And that's, that leads to, what we say, idle talk, gossip, fault finding, so many other things. Always be enthusiastic. Always remain determined, determined and use your time in Krishna consciousness. Time is valuable. Time is very valuable. Time is, Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj says, time is 
precious. Someone asked him, asked Ma, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, is time like money? He said, no. He said, time is precious or valuable. It has a purpose. It's meant to be used in a way that brings us to the goal of life. And time is, is Krishna. Actually, Krishna is actually time. So to use our time in Krishna consciousness is to become Krishna conscious. It says in the scriptures, both with the rising and setting of the sun, another day is lost and one is closer to death. Except, the word except is used, for one who engages in hearing the glories of the all-good personality of Godhead. Then time has no effect on that person. Because what are we doing now? We're engaging in devotional service. We're hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. We're chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, taking prasadam, associating with devotees. We're becoming purified, we're becoming free from our material attachments and the narthas. And we're starting to become more and more attached to Krishna and devotional service. So we, we continue that. And when death comes along, if we haven't made it to the the stage of purity. What do we do after death? We continue doing the same thing. There's nothing different. So time really has no effect for one who is engaged in devotional self. For a materialist, time is the, the, the passing of time is the worst thing. Janika Pandit says that for a materialist, if they want to be successful in material life, they have to forget about death. Because if a materialist starts thinking in terms of death or, you know, how can he become enthusiastic to fulfill his plans if this, this idea is hanging over his head? So he has to forget it. He has to enter into the illusion in order to be successful in the illusion. He has to forget about death. But for devotee, devotee always remembers time is short. How much time do we have? We don't know. The idea of being young is a form of intoxication. There are many stories in this regard how you know, persons in the prime of life have been cut short just by, you know, say, the elements of providence. So we can't somehow think in terms of youth or age. We have to think in terms of what is important now? Actually, there's only one time. Time, there's only one time. Time is now. Bhakti Vinoda Kaur, he says, forget the past that sleeps, near the future, dream it all, act in times that are with thee in progress ye shall call. Very beautiful poetic rhyme, but really with a very deep, deep philosophical meaning. The past is gone. I mean, we can learn from the past. That is a fact. And we should. But we can't undo the past. It's already done. So why lament about what is already gone? And the future is simply a dream. People in the material world, the materialists, they live in the future. It's always going to be better in the future. It's not exactly right. I got my plans. I have my ideas. It's, if I just follow this course of action, then things will get better, right? It's always going to be better later. But a devotee knows that whatever you do now makes the difference of what happens later. Because if we're Krishna conscious now, then we'll be Krishna conscious later. Everything depends on the moment. Sometimes we're not in a, we always look to an ideal situation. But what is the ideal situation? The ideal situation is that remember the instructions of the spiritual master. Become Krishna conscious now. Just remember Krishna. Bhavananda Maharaj. <laughs> All right. Okay. I, uh, I'll give you a garland. <laughs> emphasize the importance of chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. 
just recently I had a reawakening in that area of my Krishna consciousness. I was traveling with Naranjana Swami. And Naranjana Maharaj is, he's absorbed in chanting. He chants 32 rounds a day as a regulation. And he said, I won't trade it for anything. Despite all his responsibilities, all his services, and whatever else he's doing, 32 rounds a day. And he finishes them early and finishes them before breakfast. 32 rounds. So being in that association, I couldn't help but get, let me say, more uh, attached to chanting. And I started to realize more that, yeah, this is what I should be doing more. Have that more enthusiastic for getting up early and for chanting my rounds. And so I started to do that. And I started to feel much more happy in Krishna consciousness. Just seeing the importance, or not only the importance, but practically the exclusivity of our spiritual progress really situates on chanting the holy names of the Lord. Radhanath Maharaj used to say many times in his lecture, Lord Chaitanya emphasized two things. Out of all the aspects of devotional practice, he emphasized two things. Chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantras and service to the Vaishnavas. Association with and service to Vaishnavas. And then you could add the third thing, which was also Lord Chaitanya's principle, showing compassion to the fallen conditioned souls. These three things really make up the life of a devotee. Namruchi, Vaishnav Seva, Jiva Doya. These are really the essence of our practice. But everything really sit, situates ourselves on chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Srila Prabhupada was asked many times the same question. What do you get from chanting? How do you feel when you, when you chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra? Prabhupada answered in different ways according to the circumstance. One time he said, I feel powerful. I feel fearless. I'm associating with Krishna. These were different responses to that question. So everything there in the holy name. But the holy name reveals itself in different ways. But one of the ways is that our enthusiasm or our eagerness to chant. Not only in eager, but enthusiasm. But it's, it's a matter of life and death. Spiritual life and death. We should have that conception. That I want to chant. I want to chant my rounds. I want to chant kirtan. Everything. I just want to chant. I mean, we have other responsibilities, too, and we do those things. But without chanting, it's from an Apehi Kekalam. What's the use of anything else we do, even if it comes out successful by our own evaluations? Because it's not going to be able to give us the happiness or satisfaction or even bring us to the perfectional stage of life. Everything's there on Krishna's holy name and associating with wonderful devotees. So, when you come to Chaupati, there's always kirtan, there's always wonderful devotees. This is a wonderful place. Continue. And one, I guess one of the things that Maya kind of tricks you after a while in devotional services, she makes you think, oh, you've been chanting, I've been reading, and I've been doing so many things. But there must be something else to this process. But it actually is it's quite simple because everything springs from those, from those principles. Chanting, associating with devotees in a mood of service and surrender. And preaching, showing compassion, giving Krishna consciousness to others. Really, it's a quite a simple process in and of itself. Remain enthusiastic, determined, and... The wonderful results will come. They're coming. They're coming more and more. So I want to thank all of you for your enthusiasm, because I'm getting, I become more and more, we say, happy by being here.
just by being here, I, complete, I feel completely happy, completely satisfied, and completely nourished in my spiritual life. So I thank you very much. And I especially thank my dear God brother, His Holiness Radnath Maharaj. Thank you very much. Shira Prabhupada Ki Omagyanatimarandasyakyanamchanasalakaya <coughs> Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. <laughs> I'm very embarrassed to speak after such a distinguished preachers and speakers. I definitely have to thank them <coughs> for enlightening us today. I can very easily repeat what they said. For me, yearly visit to Chopati Temple is a culmination of my year of service. Because <clears throat> here I can see the future. I can see where I can... Uh, go for, what is the direction to go. And it's a wonderful temple, wonderful devotees, wonderful atmosphere. And I'm coming here as a beggar, not as a preacher. This morning, His Holiness Radhanath Maharaj asked me to speak, <clears throat> and I said I, I would definitely prefer to hear, to listen, because I'm coming here to get purified, to be able to continue with the very difficult service which is there in Russia. So <clears throat> I'm here as a beggar to beg for your blessings. <clears throat> Bhavananda Prabhu gave wonderful lecture, but I felt little uncomfortable when he spoke about bringing down the governments. Because I'm from Russia and I thought maybe KGB is recording his lectures. <laughs> I'm still conditioned very much. <laughs> but actually, we do want it. <laughs> because the world is crazy. <clears throat> and we're trying to serve Srila Prabhupada and Lord Chaitanya in our little humble way. <clears throat> uh, as you know, several times I made presentation here about Moscow Temple Project, and it's <clears throat> through much difficulties it's <clears throat> coming up. And my humble request to all of you to bless us so that very soon a glorious temple of Lord Krishna will be open in Moscow. Please do it. After so much endeavor, we finally <clears throat> uh, secured the land. And uh, initially, the government gave us one, uh, two and a half acres of land in the center of the city. And then they took it back, and they wanted to cheat us and to kick us out. But we were persisting and insisting and trying to do different you know, schemes how to obtain the land. And finally, <clears throat> after so much endeavor, they gave us, instead of two and a half acres of land, five acres of land. <laughs> and at that point, I definitely have to thank His Holiness Radhanath Maharaj for his ongoing support. He's not only doing this temple. He's not only helping so many temples all over the world, but I must say that he is the real owner of 
yet another project, this temple in Moscow. He is the real force and power behind it. Thank you very much, Maharaj. <laughs> and <coughs> also my sincere thanks to uh, Srinathji Prabhu, who is also here. Actually, <coughs> it was his idea when he came to Moscow <coughs> and he saw the land which the government gave, he said, it's a useless land. <laughs> he said, it's just a concrete jungle here. You will not be able to do anything good here. Just get some other land further away, but in a better place. <laughs> And he inspired us so much, and not only inspired, he really stepped forward to help in a very significant way. So I really thank him for his help and support to this service which we are trying to do. And in reality, <clears throat> what we are trying to do is just to serve Srila Prabhupada and to somehow or other uh, engage our own energy in this service. This big project <clears throat> is for this purpose, to engage as many people as possible in the service. Once Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur Prabhupada was trying to build a big temple. And somebody came to him <clears throat> and offered him a few lakhs of rupees. And amazingly enough, Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur Prabhupada rejected it, which is very unusual for any fundraiser. It's not a very traditional way to raise funds. <laughs> he said, I don't need your lakhs of rupees. I need crore of paisas. And the meaning of the statement is that I don't want just somebody come and do it. I want to engage everyone uh, in this spirit of voluntarily service to <clears throat> be able to connect with Krishna through this service. <laughs> And this is actually the meaning of Prabhupada's movement. Prabhupada came to the West to give all of us this rare and very unique opportunity uh, to engage our energy in service of Lord Krishna. And this is our good fortune. We have to be thankful again and again uh, to be able to participate in this movement <clears throat> and to be able to do a little bit, our little contribution uh, uh, in this vision of Prabhupada. And at the end of my little talk, I don't want to talk too much because I think I don't want to overshadow the wonderful instructions which Bhavananda Prabhu and Chandra Mauli Maharaj have given. But I wanted to tell two little stories <clears throat> from my experience in Russia, how <clears throat> Prabhupada's power is still very much working in this world and how Prabhupada's purity is changing lives of hundreds and thousands of people. Recently we had Prabhupada's marathon where so many devotees went out to distribute books and in our little ashram <clears throat> which we have in Moscow, we just recently built it, we distributed 23,000 Maha big books of Srila Prabhupada and, <laughs> and everyone was in this fever to distribute more and more and more. Sometimes in this fever, these devotees, they were kind of overlooked to small books. They wanted to distribute big books, Bhagavad Gita, Sriman Bhagavatam. One devotee told me a story that he <clears throat> ran out of all big books. And the last person whom he gave the book uh, was a young man two young men, and he gave him just Rajavidya, little book. And this young man was about to board the train to go from the city where he was distributing to Moscow. <clears throat> and he said, this is a little book, please read it on the train. You have plenty of uh, free time in the train. And if you go to Moscow, go to Moscow temple. If you find it interesting, you will find more in the temple. So what happened with this man, this devotee told me that he read the book on the train and next morning, first thing he did, he came to the temple and he said, I want to serve Krishna and I want to surrender my life to him. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Just by reading this little book of Srila Prabhupada, he was totally transformed. And there was another very beautiful story, which I think was Krishna's kind of arrangement for us to remind 
how important it is to give people a chance to associate with Prabhupada through reading his books. Bhavananda Prabhu told this very uh, striking story about the power of association. <laughs> <laughs> so when we give people books, uh, we give them the chance to associate directly with Prabhupada, with his purity, with his pure heart. And this is the most important thing which may happen in anyone's life. So one devotee who was distributing books during this marathon time, he told me a very amazing story. He said it was dark. In Moscow it gets dark very early in the winter. And he had a big stack of books, <clears throat> and he was distributing it near subway station, metro station. So one lady was passing by. She was a young lady, <clears throat> and he approached her. And there are so many salesmen who are trying to sell this book or that book or this or that or something like this. And when he approached this lady, the lady, which is not unusual during Sankirtan, during book distribution, started chastising him. You're nonsense. You're fool. You're wasting your life. You're totally useless. You're giving out these useless books. You would do much better if you would distribute Prabhupada's books. <laughs> He didn't know that he was doing exactly this, but when he heard this, he thought it was Krishna telling him <laughs> what he should do. <laughs> and this is Krishna telling all of us through this lady <laughs> what we should do in our life. <laughs> we should try to engage ourselves in service of Prabhupada, and we should try to engage everyone else in this glorious mission. And in this way, every one will become happy, and all the governments will fall down for sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada ki, Shopati Temple ki, His Holiness Radhanath Maharaj ki. Thank you very much. Back to that story about the power of association. <laughs> Striking story. What do most of you do when you see what Bhavananda Prabhu was explaining? Stool on the street. Usually you accelerate the pace that you're walking, <laughs> not wanting to get near it. That is human nature. But a great Vaishnava like Srila Prabhupada, he saw all kinds of stool-like things on the street. And he fed them. He became like a father, a mother, a friend. He extended himself like anything. And by his association, that stool became like a sweet gulab jamun. That is the power of association. I'd like to tell one simple foolish story which has a nice purport at the end. Recently I was in London whereby the order of the Vaishnavas I was undergoing some surgery I was getting so many messages of people praying for me. I was thinking I should do these surgeries every year. <laughs> I never, all the nice things I do, nobody prays for me. 
But anyways, it was the day I was to leave the hospital. I was going to go to somebody's house. And one devotee, a distinguished lady, wanted to come to meet me. She lived five minutes from the house I was going to. So she was going to come in the morning, and she called Govinda Prabhu. And I said, I'm going to be moving out this afternoon to this house. It's only five minutes. So tell her she could come to meet me there in the afternoon at five o'clock. So about seven o'clock, I'm wondering, where is this devotee? And finally she comes and she tells me the story of her day. You would like to hear? She called a devotee on his cell phone and said, is Maharaj there at this time? And he said, yes, he's here. Please come immediately. Now, the nature of cell phones is you can call someone and you don't know where they are. (laughs) They could be in Moscow or Bombay or New York or in a boat in the ocean. It's the same number. So somehow or other, she thought I was at the hospital. So she drove through London traffic. It took her about 45 minutes to reach the hospital. On the way, she called. So I'm coming right now. Oh, yes, yes, we're expecting you. Where should I go? said, come to the third floor. So she gets to the hospital. She goes to the third floor. said, where are you? said, I'm on the third floor. But I'm looking everywhere. I don't see you. said, well, you just ask. I'm asking everywhere. He says, well, about... A half hour later, she calls again. He says, I couldn't find you on the third floor. He said, but I'm here on the third floor. Where are you now? I'm at the reception. He said, I'm coming down right now to the reception. A half hour later, she calls. She said, I'm waiting at the reception. Where are you? He said, I'm at the reception. She said, what wing of the hospital are you at? He said, I'm not, not at the hospital, I'm at the house. <laughs> it was five minutes away from her house. Anyways, when she finally came, she was... She already had to go. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking... Srila Prabhupada explained how these unnecessary necessities that man creates create so many complications in one's life. Just like we were told, Srila Prabhupada, he managed an entire worldwide society better than anyone can do today. By millions of times, he had no computers. He had no cellular phone. He practically never even used a telephone. He was against telex because he said people will, devotees will simply use it for prajalpa. He wrote letters by what we call snail mail. And how efficient he was. Yet with the coming of technology, so many complications. Srila Prabhupada said that Krishna consciousness 
you can take a thorn to pull out another thorn with. I use this analogy in the sense that modern science, modern technology, all these modern things of the world, because people are so addicted to them, you can utilize utilize all of these things in order to take out the thorn of people's attachments and complexities to these things. But if you're not very, very careful, you use one thorn to take another out, and you end up with two thorns, (laughs) and then three thorns, and four thorns, and soon you have 108 thorns. This yukta vairagya of utilizing the things of this world in the service of Krishna must be done very, very carefully. Oftentimes devotees, they take advantage of this concept of yukta vairagya. We could use everything in Krishna's service just to justify wasting their time and enjoying sense gratification. Srila Prabhupada said Krishna consciousness is simple living and high thinking. We really don't need any of these things. We can utilize them to reach people. But we have to be very, very careful that we do not become implicated in what they were initially made for. Because basically all these technologies and sciences of the world were specifically made for sense gratification. There's a powerful energy behind them for that purpose. And we have to be very powerful in our conviction to actually use them in Krishna consciousness. Otherwise, we'll get sucked into that energy. Computers. Yes, we can reach millions of people. And we can do so many fabulous things by utilizing them. Architecture, art, so many uh, accounting. However, Sham Sundar Prabhu told his first meeting with Prabhupada, he taught him accounting. He just drew a line in a piece of paper and said, you put the deposits here and the withdrawals here and everything, you're just right. It's perfect accounts. Now we have all these computers, and it doesn't even match what Prabhupada did. (laughs) In fact, if the computer breaks down, you'll probably go to jail because you have no tax records. Yes. And soon we get sucked into that energy because it's so powerful. And we start utilizing them Little by little, Maya just takes our attention away from that specific mission for Krishna. And we get sucked in by this very powerful force of Kali Yuga. Cellular phones, same way. They could be used very nicely in Krishna service. I was recently in a class where a very senior sannyasi before speaking he told the whole audience turn off your cell phones we don't want any disturbances in this class everyone turn their cell phones off and while he was just making a very very critical point in his class a cell phone went off in his pocket <laughs> Sometimes I think Krishna just named it cell phone because when you're in prison, it's called a prison cell. (laughs) And it's called a cell because you can't escape. Wherever you go, you can't escape. Driving in a car, walking down the street. And to make it romantic, there's so many different types of ringers. 
Some are even chanting Hare Krishna. <laughs> Playing ragas or other Bollywood type hymns. <laughs> yes, they can be utilized very, very nicely in Krishna's service. But more often than not, they divert us. Because all these technologies were created to give persons a higher degree of sense gratification. They've actually been created by people whose purpose is to divert the masses away from Krishna, knowingly or unknowingly. So Srila Prabhupada talked about Yukta Vairagya, but we must be very, very careful not to fall into the trap of the complexities unless we're very, very fixed in our sadhana, unless we're really, really taking shelter of the holy names, unless we really have quality association of devotees, and unless we're really determined to make spiritual progress, then in a very imperceptible, subtle way, all of these things will divert our attention away from Krishna and drag us back into a state of consciousness that we rejected. Or as the analogy of association. By associating with these things, they could turn your gulabjaman consciousness into... Very good. <laughs> but if we have good chanting of Krishna's names, good association, and we really are fixed in our service attitude, then all of these technologies can help turn so many stool-like minds throughout the world into gulabjamans. This is very symbolic. Right? <laughs> it's the best part of the class. <laughs> so we must be very, very careful at every step. When this lady came, I was explaining these things to her. That just see how such a simple thing becomes so complicated just by a little bit of misunderstanding. But actually, that's what Kali Yuga is about. Simply through miscommunication and misunderstanding, there are world wars. There's hatred. If miscommunication and misunderstandings are not cleared up very quickly, they can escalate into something that's impossible to resolve in, in ordinary relationships. And the more things are depersonalized through so much technology and machinery, the more possibility there is for this type of miscommunication, which creates quarrel, and hypocrisy. So many complications. And this lady cried. And she said, that's not the lesson I learned from this. She said, I learned from this that you cannot take the association of devotees for granted. I was thinking it was just such a simple thing to be with devotees, just to drive my car. But I was in through so many traffic jams 
and I was making so many calls, and I was going upstairs and downstairs and upstairs and downstairs. And finally, when I got here, I realized the association of devotees is so precious, we should never think it's just something so easy to get. After millions and millions and millions of births, by Krishna's mercy, we get the association of devotees. We should never take it to be something ordinary. We should never think it to be something we deserve. You cannot criticize or offend Vaishnavas unless you take it to be something very, very ordinary. Something that you really think you deserve better than. But actually, to be in the association of those who love the Lord, or even those who are aspiring to love the Lord, is the ultimate gift of God. It is something that one out of hundreds and thousands of people will achieve. When we're coming to the temple, when we're meeting another devotee, do not just take it to be an everyday affair. It is a supreme blessing. And to the degree we cherish that blessing, to that degree we will benefit by it and we will advance in spiritual life. And all of these realizations come about when we take very seriously with a grateful heart the Lord's gifts. And in that spirit we come together to chant the holy name. Do you know what a rare gift it is to be chastised by Bhavananda Prabhu? <laughs> or to hear the sweet words of Chandra Mali Maharaj? Or to just be in the presence of the aura of Bhakti Vigyan Goswami Maharaj, who's fought tirelessly, fearlessly against all odds. to establish his temple in Moscow. In 1971, Srila Prabhupada wrote several letters saying, we should have a temple in Moscow, a beautiful temple. It's never been. All these years, we were just in some government house for so many years, yes? It was nothing. persecutions by the KGB and communisms for years. One of our devotees here from Ukraine, Bardraj Prabhu, he was such a dynamic preacher and such a threat to the communist government. He was imprisoned, tortured. Achyutapriya Prabhu from Ukraine, who was also here with about 30 devotees, how much risk he had to take Bhaktivikya and Goswami Maharaj, he was a PhD. The KGB personally brought him to their headquarters to convince him how dangerous the Hare Krishna movement was. He was just a new, curious visitor. But after hearing how seriously they took it, he decided this is a serious movement. <laughs> If the KGB takes this so seriously, it must be real. Krishna spoke through KGB agents to bring him to the lotus feet of Srila Prabhupada. Very difficult. But now, for the first time in history, we have 
Srila Prabhupada, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission has land in the name of Iskan in Moscow. Nineteen seventy one, that's thirty six years after Prabhupada's order. It's finally being fulfilled. And each and every one of you, such special jewels, never ever ever take anything in Krishna consciousness for granted. Or you'll lose it. Every devotee, every opportunity to chant the holy name, every time you pick up one of Srila Prabhupada's books, understand this is such an unlimitedly precious gift. I don't deserve it. Let me appreciate it with a grateful heart. And chant Hare Krishna. And one more thing about association. Krishna is not different than his name. Let us do Sankirtan.